Are you looking to up your dog game as a trainer or owner? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Vermont Dog Trainer Show the Vermont Dog Trainer with your host, Ian Grant. Hey, everybody. How you doing tonight? It is uh, Tuesday, as usual, 8.15 p.m. or like 8.16, maybe, something close to that. Um, boy, it's been an interesting, interesting week for me here between... Uh, a couple of dogs going home. We sent another one home today. And <clears throat> I've been getting a lot of feedback about my recent post. I don't know if you guys saw it. Hey, Heather. Long time no talk. Heather's dog went home today. I uh, forgot to post a picture of that. So um, hopefully be putting that one out probably tomorrow morning. Uh, but it's been an interesting week really working with, you know, dog sensitivity and uh, the picture I put up of the mountain with the the uh, the small step or the um, breaking the holy cow I can't talk tonight. Okay, let's start over. The post that I put up with the picture of the mountain where I feel like everybody perceives that mountain is like the dog training mountain, right? Like this is what it takes to get a well trained dog. I got to climb this mountain, um, and I think uh, Rachel from. Uh, Switzerland is probably going to see this. And, uh, you know, I think she had posted something about how that mountain doesn't look like that's, you know, really climbable. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to put that up because I feel like most people uh, look at that mountain as is as it's impossible to climb, meaning having a well-trained dog is impossible to get there. And look, if I, you know... I'm gonna relate this to like a fitness kind of thing. If somebody told me I had to lose 50 pounds, holy cow, like I know there's a lot of work to do. But first step, waking up in the morning is just getting that very first workout in, that very first exercise. And uh, I, I think that's where people look at it and think it's so overwhelming, so overwhelming. Ian, how do I do that? How do I get my dog to calm down at the front door? Well, baby steps. That's all there is to it. Baby steps. These or small steps is what I wrote for tonight. It it takes time, you guys. Don't be in such a rush. Don't be in such a rush to have a well-trained dog. There are reasons why dogs come to us for board and trains that are two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks. Because it takes time. Not only does it take time to create a pattern in a dog that that is something that is repeatable in a setting where there's hardly any stip stimulation to then take that groundwork and to add in another little stimulation and hopefully that foundation stays there and then you add in another stimulation and hope that foundation stays there and it's something that we have to build on over and over and over and over again and it takes time so i i feel like when i talk to somebody on the phone for the first time maybe they're interested in getting their dogs trained I feel like they are, they are so overwhelmed and I get the, Ian, you need to teach me. Yeah, I do, but I feel like it, it can be so overwhelming for um, a prospective client, a current client, a past client, thinking that their dog has to be the ultimate well-trained dog. If you are happy with your dog, then that's a good start. Um, I I had a... A private lesson today with a lady who won a, the, the free private lesson um, about, I don't know, a month or two ago. She brought in a wonderful 15-month-old German Shepherd. And uh, and she's doing fantastic with this dog. And by the way, I have some amazing, amazing, amazing body language video between her dog and my dog, Gemma, uh, that I'll be posting on YouTube tomorrow. So... Holy cow, it's like 12 minutes long. It's like a 10 minute clip and then a two minute clip. And it is truly some of the best body language uh, video that I have ever, ever captured by far. I mean, I've caught some good stuff in the past, but this was crazy good, crazy good. So be sure to check the, pod, or the uh, Facebook page in the morning. So, um, Anyways, so you guys, I want you to think in small steps. Tonight, tomorrow, the next day, whatever the case may be. Don't think that your dog has to be like this canine dog, police dog, where it listens to every single little thing. Those dogs have gone through years and years and years of training. 
and repetition on top of that and repetition so this is what I want you guys to focus on and if you have questions tonight I'm here uh, willing ready willing and able to answer your questions but uh, you know I, I've talked a lot about sensitivity lately I've talked a lot about these small steps lately I feel like for me personally I am really just starting just now to really get into the depths of how dogs think how they work how I can relay that to the client um, you know and it just takes some time to be able to understand that and then be able to, to move forward with that you know on top of it <clears throat> um, so a private lesson today with this amazing German Shepherd amazing owner um, also a take-home session today with um, as you saw earlier Heather that piped in um, with her with her dog on a remote collar working with eat with uh, recall and other issues um, and then we did an evaluation today of this other uh, older German Shepherd who lives with three other German Shepherds and um, has had issues with one of them so it's like today was a full day I mean a full day and I felt like it went by that fast but I wouldn't have it any other way uh, but this other German Shepherd <coughs> that we had was just way too forward with everybody just, just driving his nose right down underneath their belly to get a good whiff of whatever was down there stay there linger there come back up jaws like you know like you know this high high level stimulation and then would sometimes put his chin on another dog's back and uh, Serena had asked me and I think it was a little tongue-in-cheek she goes do you think this dog is dominant I'm like hell no this dog is not dominant just because he throws his dog his chin over another dog's back to me doesn't mean that this guy is dominant plus he was so stimulated uh, he never picked up his pace quicker than a fast walk and of course it's not like our room is a hundred yards long either so it's not like he was uh, running around his mouth was so wide open his tongue hanging out to me this was just he had a lot of that what we call social pressure uh, you've heard me talk about it in the past just built up where he just doesn't know how to how to act around other dogs and it was uh, to his owners they're like of course you know he fights at home but he, he gets to your place and he's doing well but we've also removed the owner we've removed the environment we've stripped everything away from him that we could physically and now we're gonna put him in front of a group of dogs how are you going to act and that's what I enjoy I love seeing what that dog defaults back to to see how he reacts to see how he learns uh, he wasn't very wary or very aware of the leash that we were using with him which was just a slip lead um, I, I think I might have one little clip of him that I can probably show you guys at some point uh, but he he's a big strong dude too so I you know if he ever got going in one direction he's probably gonna stay in that direction for a while uh, so he, he was he was interesting we had him out with the group a few times today uh, also hanging with the group but just in a kennel you know so he can be on the perimeter watching everybody and, and learning and everything so uh, I think we're gonna see him back for daycare uh, a couple of times too so and like I said we sent Jojo home today I'll be posting a picture of him um, and then I don't know if you guys saw the picture of Atari uh, the husky or wait I don't there's a fancy name and I forgot the breed and I can't think of it so I please forgive me if Atari's owner is watching this um, but Atari came in this week so we're gonna be doing training with her Helena the husky is coming in for trainings we're doing training with her uh, so things are, are certain our, our season our year has has picked up um, so it's uh, you know but here's the thing you guys and and I haven't uh, Tamaskin that's what it is thank you Tamaskin I couldn't remember all I could think of was Timaquan but that wasn't it um, <clears throat> so Atari we've just been doing some social with so far getting um, getting him settled in and I'm going to be doing a leash video with him his very first session on leash because I wanted to show everybody um, the videos that I've done in the past are dogs that just come to us for daycare one of them ha one of them the leash sensitivity video I did with uh, Timber uh, brown chocolate lab and he was there for training with us so I wanted I want to do it with Atari too so you guys can see here's a younger dog a little more energetic 
Uh, let's see what gets established there. So it, it should be fun. I've got some videos coming your way. Hit a little bit of a lull here lately. <coughs> but uh, I'm, ex I'm excited to show you guys some of the, the good stuff. I'm telling you, I can't, I can't even explain to you how I feel about uh, the body language video that you're going to see between Gemma and, uh, and Maggie, the German Shepherd puppy. It's amazing. So, uh, Laura, yes, we do board and trains for sure. So, anyways, if you guys have any questions tonight, I am more than happy to answer them for you. So, fire away at will. Uh, I'm fighting my throat a little bit right now, so please forgive me with all my breaks of drinking water. Uh, in the meantime, I see uh, Tim from Alaska's uh, hanging out with us tonight. Um, and uh, some other regulars as well, Linda and Heather and uh, the whole bit, uh, Audrey and Lisa. My whole crew's kind of back. Uh, Julie, Tim, Fran, Becky. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> so guys, look, if you're having an issue with your dog, whatever that issue is, give me an example. Somebody throw one out. We're going to completely do this off the cuff. So you guys get an idea of what, maybe how my brain works with it, but also how you can break this down into steps to figure out where is that pinpoint problem for your dog, um, other than like dog to dog aggression, you know what I mean? So uh, I have a very timid rescue who I can't crate train and he's dedicating in the house. I'm assuming that might mean defecating. Uh, right, Laura? That, is that kind of what I'm I'm guessing? Nothing like autocorrect, probably? There we go. That's what I figured. All right. So, look. So, a, a, a dog like this, a very timid rescue. Um, whoops. There. Look. So, timid. Th this is the thing. When we use the word timid to explain a dog, uh, you know, to describe a dog, we think of that dog as being very unsure um, you know, tail tucked between the legs, ears laid back, you know, head kind of low, we kind of get the wide eyed. These are the things that I think of when somebody says timid. So it makes sense that, you, you know, there's going to be issues with, um, well, there's a difference between timid and submissive though too, Laura, uh, but I don't want to lose track here. So part of this, of what you have going on is, you know, having a timid dog. Well, timid dogs are going to become more timid when people aren't realizing and aren't understanding what that dog is giving to us. A timid dog needs space. It doesn't need a lot of love, okay? And here's the thing. Everybody sees that timid dog, that like scared look, head down, like what's going on, eyes back and forth. And they go, oh, this poor thing. I'm a dog person. I can go over and help it. Guess what? Your help for the two minutes is not going to help that dog long term. It may help for the two minutes, great. It's not gonna help long term. <clears throat> we have to allow that dog to start to use its nose, become curious, become inquisitive, and be social. Dogs are naturally social. So to have a timid dog goes completely against what dogs naturally are, which should be curious and inquisitive. Unless they've been coddled so much, Laura, I'm not saying this is you, this might be something that happened way before you. Unless they've been coddled so much that this is, this is what we want, right? So you see that scared or nervous dog, everybody says to the dog, as you can see it drives me insane, everybody says, it's okay. No, it's not. We say that to a dog, the dog is going to take it. Oh, it's okay, it's okay to be scared. Oh, okay. But we're also not going to punish or discipline or use any of those crazy words to deal with that situation. What that dog needs more than anything in the world is routine, is structure, guidance, direction, uh, patterns, respect from you. Do you see? The, 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 the love word hasn't even popped up yet. It hasn't even popped up yet. So we want that dog to understand that we also are there to protect it. And when some scary person walks in the house, which could be your best friend, but to your dog, it's that big scary person again that won't leave me alone, that keeps coming towards me and all this dog can do is tuck its tail and run. You see what I mean? So also, so you, when you're dealing with a timid dog and one that doesn't want to go in a crate because also 
um, what that dog is giving to you while you're trying to crate train it as far as body language is probably something that you're uh, that you don't have knowledge of or you're, you're aware of so then you're kind of fighting this battle of the dog telling you I don't like this I don't like this I don't like this and then we're going oh but it's okay you can go in you can go in you can go in so in order to crate train we always suggest feeding them in the crate first with the door open and if you have to put the dish outside of the door to start with for maybe a week and then the dish goes just inside the door for a week always leave that door open we don't ever want to put that dog in and, sh and, and shut the crate if they're already scared of it the other part about crate training that I don't think many people realize is that we don't try crate training by putting our dog in in the morning and then we go to work for seven hours uh, that doesn't work usually too well I haven't heard many instances of it working well at all and that takes that takes time and dedication so we have to get that dog used to being in the crate for feeding to me if we we're gonna really break this down into small steps right small steps don't shove the dog in shut the door and leave and go shopping for four hours it doesn't work that way so break this down into small steps small steps is let's start with the food outside the crate okay do that for a while let's put the food inside the crate for a while let's do that right and have actual feeding time so this is like an event um, or a ritual if you will and we practice that over and over and over again and then <clears throat> once this has been going on for a couple of weeks then what we do is we take the dog we go for a nice walk when it's not 20 below zero or 20 feet of snow outside uh, and then we take the dog for a walk <coughs> And then when we get done from the walk, allow them to drink a little bit of water, still on leash, and then we guide them into the crate. And we guide them in and bring them back out. And guide them in and bring them back out. And guide them in and bring them back out. Until you can just pretty much point that dog into the crate and it walks in and it comes right back out. We have to create a good association with that crate now to help you for years to come. It cannot happen quick. Everybody wants this. Everybody, everybody. I'm giving you baby steps. It could be a two-week process. It could be a three-week process. I don't know. It depends on the dog. It depends on your routine. It depends on how much you work and how much time you spend on the dog. So you have to break it down into small steps. <clears throat> and then once the dog is good at going into the crate over and over and over again, well, then we stop and we slowly start to shut the door, right? And then we have to gear the reaction from there. If they are in a complete panic mode, probably not a good idea to go any further, okay? but we wanna do our best to end on a good note. However, if the dog goes in there, at this time after two or three weeks of like eating in there and everything, we should be pretty solid to start with. <clears throat> We're just gonna shut the door for a couple of minutes. Hang there with your dog. Do not walk away. Open the door, bring your dog back out. It has to be baby steps. Look, trainers can do it differently, all right, uh, with dogs that we have in the facility because we have access to them 24 7 literally um, and also we are working them differently throughout the day it's our job to train those dogs every day they come to us for a board and train so we have access to that people are working we have lives uh, it takes longer but it still can be accomplished so look it's all a part of that whole uh, small steps breaking things down and now look I haven't mentioned the whole going to the bathroom in the house thing right because we want to create more patterns now look if a dog is going to the bathroom in the house, number one, I'm probably gonna start keeping track of what time that that's happening to make sure that the dog is outside when it's happening. Number two, if you're living in the north or north, northeast, um, then we're dealing with just some major like weather and it's just hard for dogs to go out and stay outside too. So uh, <clears throat> that's a big part of it. So, uh, you know, look, I'm gonna time it first, see when it happens, and then from there, if it's just like random times, then we're going to work on um, a feeding routine, making sure there's no free feeding going on. Um, and then I'm probably going to start tethering this dog to something in the house where if it does go to the bathroom, it's not going on anything that's costing a lot of money. Um, but, you know, it's the old adage, dogs don't go in the bathroom where they, where they lay, which I'm still not convinced of that. Um, but when you can't keep track of them, it's better than them going off in the side room in the corner and going to the bathroom. At least you can kind of keep track of them when you know where they're tethered. So um, that's just kind of my thought on that. See what I mean about breaking things down? It takes time. 
And time is also respectful too. Not only is it patient on, not only does it require patience on your part, um, but those small steps, small, small steps are also making you more aware of what it takes to be successful. And remember, we always say we go slow to go fast, right? We don't go fast because then you end up taking way longer for sure. So, um, uh, yeah, I won't even try now. He has boundaries in the house as well as outside, which works for now. But thank you. I mean to send them to you. Yeah, Laura, just you can give us give us a call and we can at least give you some options, you know? Sorry, I had to take a drink here. All right. Uh, there was another question I saw too. Uh, Bob Devine, how do I deal with separation anxiety in an old dog? Well, I, here's the thing. I got a lot of questions to go along with that too because is this an old dog that you just adopted? <clears throat> or is this an old dog that, that you had for a very long time that just started to show this behavior? Because we've got kind of two different ways that we can look at this. Um, and then when you're talking old dog, we gotta also make sure that medically everything is clear and that we're in good shape. So there's a lot of variables that go along with this, uh, Bob, just to let you know. So it's kinda hard for me to answer that one um, in regards to what is kinda happening um, in your world, for sure. So, <coughs> um, look, so I got an update on Shiloh. I know some of you been, have been asking um, how my dog is doing, which I put up some pictures of him last week. Um, blood test results came back. He's got elevated enzymes in his liver. Um, and that is pretty much it for right now. They don't know what else is going on. X-rays um, have come back negative. They've actually drawn blood twice. It was consistent both times. Uh, and tomorrow I'm headed to get him an ultrasound. So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, with him I and here's the other thing is I don't get the you know they do the ultrasound but I don't get the results right then and there because they got to go read them for a while too and, and everything so uh, he has lost probably in about two weeks um, I'm, I'm guessing probably about four pounds um, somewhere around in there so uh, Laura, he does wear a Soresto. He's had one on for probably eight months now or so, something like that. So um, I'm wondering why you're, you're asking that, though. I'm, I'm guessing there's some sort of, of uh, reason for sure. So that's where we're at with him. I feel bad for the poor guy. I fed him breakfast this morning. He's just not eating. Um, and I fed him this evening, and he didn't hardly eat that much at all. He's lost two and a half pounds, almost three pounds in the last 10 days. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, Laura, I'm gonna take off this resto tonight. I don't know why, but I don't wanna take any chances with that. And I've, I've changed up his food so much. Bone broth and chick, cooked chicken, like uh, wet food. I, You know, I've done, uh, Huh, elevated liver enzymes and no appetite. That's insane that it's the same thing. Holy cow. Huh. Okay. Well, that's the stunner of the night for sure. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. So, yeah, he's just not eating that much for, for sure. Laura, how do they know it was the caller that was doing it though? How do they, how do they relate it to that? And I'm guessing what part of the collar worked its way into the into the skin and system. Huh. <clears throat> um, Bob, there is a lot of questions. Yeah, if you want, just call the office and we can set up like a private lesson or something. Um, yeah. Well, I'll and Laura, I'll take it off tonight. I don't I don't know. I'll, I'll try it. I, don't, I mean, I can't imagine. And now it's going to make me look it up. Of course, I'm going to find all sorts of random answers that I don't want to find. <laughs> right? It's like, oh, I got a scratchy throat. And you look up and it's like, Phew. you get the, all the wrong answers in the world. Bobby, yeah, I've, I've uh, huh, man, bone broth, everything. Like, and he, 
there's sometimes you won't even touch bone broth and chicken and cook chicken. Like, I mean, what what else can I do other than maybe go get some bacon, right? So I I don't I it's uh it's it's kind of crazy. So, anyways, you guys, I'm gonna cut this short before I completely lose my voice tonight. You stay tuned on this page tomorrow. At some point, hopefully I'm going to put up the video from YouTube because it is freaking amazing uh, of Gemma and this other dog, Maggie. So uh, I wish you guys all well tonight. Think baby steps, please. Small steps. Come up with a behavior, a very small behavior in your dog that you want to change. Very small. And then try to break that behavior up in about six or seven or eight different steps of how you can break it down and work each one of those little steps of that behavior. I think you'll be amazed at what you can come up with, not necessarily practicing to start with, just think about it. Uh, just like what I wrote on that post, taking your dog for a walk, 10 steps before you're actually getting down off of your own steps on your deck. So happy training you guys tonight. Uh, keep you updated on Shiloh and uh, you guys are great. Thanks for showing up again. I can't thank you enough. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Vermont Dog Trainer Show with Ian Grant. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And for more great content and to stay up to date, visit Vermont Dog Trainer Show on Facebook. We'll catch you next time.